If you wanna pass the GED science exam, you need to know what to study. When you have an understanding of what will be on the test, you can study more effectively. In this video, I'll be talking about what you need to know about physics to score 145 on the GED science test and achieve your goals. This is the ninth video in my GED science series. So far, we've talked about life sciences and chemistry topics that you'll see on the GED test. Now we're working on the physics topics that you'll need with more about velocity, acceleration, and the laws of motion. Having a better idea about what you'll need to know about can help you focus your attention on the best resources for you. Like always, this video won't contain everything that you could learn about this topic, but I hope that it'll be a great place for you to start as you begin to study. In the last video, we talked about physics as a study of matter and energy, and we talked about work and the different forms of energy. A big takeaway from that discussion is that energy is all about motion and the potential for motion. In fact, everything is moving at all times. For one thing, all matter is composed of atoms, which are all moving to a greater or lesser extent at all times. What's more, we're all on a planet, Earth, that is constantly rotating around a moving star in a moving galaxy in a universe that is constantly expanding. That level of movement is so normal to you that you don't even register it. Motion that we perceive happens in relation to the objects that surround it. You know that something is moving because it changes position in relation to something else. This is why what we call speed is a ratio between distance and time. An example of this you're definitely familiar with is miles per hour. This means that if you travel 60 miles in two hours, your speed is 60 miles every two hours. Usually though we talk about speed as the unit rate, meaning that we want that second quantity in the comparison to be a single unit. When you say miles per hour, you're talking about the number of miles you can travel in one hour. So if it takes you two hours to travel 60 miles, you are traveling on average 30 miles per hour. Velocity is the word that we use to describe speed in a specific direction. You can visualize velocity as a function of distance and time on a graph like this. I put time on the x-axis of the graph because time is the independent quantity. Time will pass whether I'm driving or not. I put distance on the y-axis because distance is the dependent quantity. How far I've traveled depends on how long I've been traveling. In bivariate situations involving time, time is usually the independent variable. And when you have a graph like this to interpret, the x-axis is always the independent variable. This line on the graph is a representation of a trip to a local mall. You can see here that the mall is 15 miles away from my house, and it took me 30 minutes to get there, or half an hour. If I had kept traveling at that same velocity for a full hour, I would have traveled 30 miles. That's why the velocity here is 30 miles per hour, even though I only traveled 15 miles. This flat part of the graph is the time that I spent at the store. See that time is still progressing? But I'm not changing my distance from my house. My velocity here is zero, or zero miles traveled during this amount of time. Finally, this downhill part is when I'm returning back to my house. See that time is progressing, but the distance from my house is getting smaller. This part of the graph shows negative velocity because I'm traveling in the opposite direction that I traveled initially. You can also see that this part of the graph is steeper than the original journey. This is because I went a little faster and I did the whole 15 miles in 20 minutes as opposed to 30 minutes. This means that my speed was 45 miles per hour. In math, we call the steepness of the line or the rate of change of the linear function the slope. And when the function describes distance and time, that steepness is the velocity. If velocity is how fast we're going, acceleration is how fast we change how fast we're going. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. If I were driving on the highway and my speed was set with cruise control to 60 miles per hour, I would have an acceleration of zero. My speed is not changing. However, when I entered the highway and had to change from 30 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour, I had a positive acceleration 
because my speed was increasing. If there was some traffic on the highway and I needed to change my speed from 60 miles per hour to 50 miles per hour, then I would have negative acceleration. The rate of that change in speed is the acceleration. Anything that changes the velocity of an object is called a force. Forces can be pushes or pulls. Two common forces to be familiar with are friction and gravity. Friction is a force that resists the motion of two objects against one another. In other words, friction is a force that drags on a moving object to slow it down, or that grips a stationary object to keep it in place. You know that if you kick a soccer ball on the grass, it slows down a lot faster than if you were to kick it on the pavement. That's because the grass is rougher. It has more friction. Gravity is the force that pulls objects to earth. You know that if you drop something from your hand, it'll fall to the ground. That's because of gravity. Actually, everything has its own gravity, but some things have more gravity than others. The amount of gravity depends on the mass of the object. Since our planet, the Earth, is the most massive thing around by far, the gravitational force that it exerts on us is enough to keep us stuck to the surface. The Earth's gravitational force is also what keeps the moon in its orbit. However, you should know that the moon is also pretty big, and it exerts its own gravity on its surroundings. In fact, the moon's gravity is what causes the water in the ocean to bulge out in the part that's nearest it. We call this high tide. On the topic of gravity, you may have heard of Sir Isaac Newton. He was a British mathematician and physicist who lived in the late 17th and 18th centuries. Legend has it that his observation of an apple falling to the ground led him to describe gravity as we understand it today. You should be familiar with Newton's three laws of motion, which are foundational to physics. The first law is the law of inertia. This one says that an object at rest will stay at rest until a force acts on it, and that an object in motion will stay in motion in the same direction at the same velocity until a force acts on it. You know this one from your life. Things don't move unless there's something to move them. And when something starts moving, it's gonna keep moving in the same direction until something stops it. Of course, a ball thrown into the air eventually does stop moving, but that's because friction in the air and gravity of the Earth slow the ball down and then bring it to the ground. If there wasn't gravity or friction, a ball that was thrown would just continue on in the same direction forever. The second law is the law of acceleration. This one says, that acceleration depends on mass and force. The greater force is applied, the greater the acceleration will be. And the more massive something is, the more force is required to attain the same acceleration. You know about this one too. Consider how much effort it takes to throw a tennis ball versus if you were to try to throw a bowling ball. Since a bowling ball is more massive than a tennis ball, it takes a lot more force to get it going. But the harder you push it, the faster it will go. An object's momentum is its mass times its velocity. Momentum is basically a measurement of how hard it would be to stop a moving object. When an object is more massive or moving faster, it's harder to slow down. And the third law of motion is the law of action and reaction. This one says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Think of paddling a canoe. You use the paddle to push the water back. And in doing so, you move forward. Or consider a bird flying. The bird uses its wings to push the air down. And in doing so, it is pushed upward into the air. You could also just think about bouncing a ball off the ground. When the ball hits the ground, it is propelled in the opposite direction into the air. Last thing to mention today, a machine is a device that transmits a force in order to displace an object. A machine can be used to multiply or augment the force that's applied in order to make work easier. Here's a list of simple machines that you should be familiar with. Incline planes, wedges, levers, pulleys, and wheels and axles. All of these things make it so that you have to apply less force in order to do the same amount of work. Okay, so that was a brief overview of velocity, acceleration, and the laws of motion that you need to be familiar with to do well on the GED science test. Of course, there is a lot more to be learned about this, so the physics folks can let us know in the comments what I missed. Speaking of that, please let me know if you have any questions so that I can answer them in future videos and we can help each other out in the comments. 
From here, I definitely recommend that you spend some time with the GED preparation manual so that you can read more passages and do practice questions so that you can feel super confident when you take the test. There are also great videos about physics on Crash Course and on Khan Academy, and they even go into like way more detail than you actually need. Remember, you're not trying to be an expert, you're just trying to be familiar with the vocabulary so that you can read and interpret those passages. On this channel, I make videos about how to study more effectively so that you can achieve your goals. Coming up, there are going to be more GED science videos with more physics topics as well as earth science and space science. So please subscribe if you're working on studying for GED science. I also have playlists about the math exam, the RLA exam, and the social studies exam, so check those out if that is where you're heading next. If this video was helpful for you, please press the like button. That is how YouTube knows that this is a great resource for studiers. It is your support that allows me to take time to make these resources for you. So thank you as always for watching and until next time, happy studying.